this. Um, well, yeah, conspiracies exist. Come on, say it with me. Conspiracy. Conspiracy. Conspiracy theorists, I have a complaint. You want to complain? Look at these shoes. I've only had them three weeks now. <laughs> Shut up. It's about this conspiracy you tried to sell me. I had a salesman show up at the door two years ago with what seemed like an incredible story of fabricated evidence and dishonest scientists, and at first I have to admit I was taken in, especially by this. Uh, but then I did some checking. Now your salesman told me that hiding the decline referred to a decline in global temperatures, but when I read the actual email from which this quote was lifted, it turned out that he was talking about proxies, and a well-known phenomenon called the divergence problem. But a lot of people are so gullible they'll still believe anything your salesmen say, and they were so convinced by this sales pitch two years ago they still cling to the belief that the decline refers to global temperatures. Now that bloody salesman is back again, peddling the same thing. 5,000 emails, which filled 25,000 pages when I put them into plain text, of supposed fraud and conspiracy. OK, I admit that at first I was sucked in, just like last time. I read a couple of emails which talked about destroying documents before any Freedom of Information request is received, and I thought, they're at it again. Ah, then I realised, of course, that these 5,000 emails aren't new. They're part of the same batch that was leaked in 2009. Look, we already knew they were keeping their data secret. I and many others criticised them for it, and since then they've released all the data. So it's kind of old news. Some of the emails aren't even new. I thought I recognised this one, and yes, it's exactly the same email that was released with the first batch in 2009. Oh, by the way, I fell for this one too. It turns out the figure being discussed isn't man's. So not only are these emails contemporaneous, some of them, I have no idea how many, are identical. Now the problem I had with the salesman last time was that he was simply giving me quotes that looked sinister, but when you actually read them in the context of the emails, they turned out to be just part of a debate about the science. So I thought at least this time your salesman would have a different approach. You know, show the whole email. Explain what it's about and how it shows a conspiracy. Uh, but no. Here's a popular one, reprinted in the Daily Mail. The trick may be to decide on the main message and use that to guide what's included and what's left out. Ooh, sounds suspicious, right? But here's what Jonathan Overpeck said in context. He's talking about condensing a lot of information into a small amount of space. And that's why he says, the trick may be to decide on the main message and use that to guide what's included and what's left out. For the IPCC, we need to know what is relevant and useful for assessing recent and future climate change. Moreover, we have to have solid data, not inconclusive information. So that paints a very different picture. This quote, which was widely circulated, is not only not a complete email, it's not even a complete sentence. The first part has been chopped off. Ironic that you're trying to sell me a story about deceptive science by showing me a quote that itself is deceptive. And here's the whole thing in context. Now, a Financial Times columnist told us this email referred to the science of climate change being manipulated for political purposes. And that's what it would look like to me if all I had was this truncated sentence. But when we look at the whole quote... And then the whole email, it turns out Thorne wasn't talking about the science of climate change at all. He was talking about a draft report to be published at a meeting. He's voicing his concern that the draft might be manipulated for political purposes. By whom, we don't know, and we don't even know if his fears were well-founded. But the very fact that he's voicing them, and that Phil Jones seems to agree that this shouldn't happen, is completely contrary to the picture we're being sold of a conspiracy. So if conspiracy theorists want to convince me these researchers are colluding to dishonestly fix the numbers, why do these email quotes show them arguing about the validity of data or criticising a figure they think is deceptive? And what you don't see until you read the emails is that there are far more cases where they're critiquing the work of researchers who don't accept the role of CO2 in global warming. Why do we see private emails like this if these alleged conspirators know that their own conclusions are phony and Christie and Douglas's conclusions are correct? 
It's the same question I had in 2009 when I showed this email, one of many examples of climate researchers arguing against hyping the science. And this email showed up again in this latest batch. Further evidence that a lot of them are simply the same emails. This is Tom Wigley writing to a group of non-scientific academics who were soliciting signatures for a letter pushing for tougher controls on carbon emissions. Scientists have an added responsibility to keep their personal views separate from the science, he writes, and to make it clear to others when they diverge from the objectivity they hopefully adhere to in their scientific research. It isn't, of course, one of the emails being quoted in the blogosphere, because, like so many other emails, it doesn't fit the conspiracy theory. If conspiracy theorists are trying to convince me that there are examples of mistakes, bodgers and bias in climate science, OK, no problem. I was convinced of that long before this anti-science campaign began. Because there are always a few scientists guilty of these sins in any branch of science. But that isn't what we're being sold. This is supposed to be a worldwide conspiracy that's dreamed up an entire scientific theory of CO2 causing warming. I'm sure I'll get the usual comments from conspiracy theorists that I'm being entirely predictable by questioning these quotes. But of course, did you really think I'd just swallow them hook, line and sinker without checking? Like some dumb Daily Mail reader? This is why I see these quotes very differently to you. Conspiracy theorists will just look at the disembodied quotes and jump to the conclusion this confirms their conspiracy, while sceptics will take the time to check the context of the quotes and therefore end up with a much clearer picture of what they mean. All I can say to sceptics out there, and I mean people who really are sceptical, not those who simply swallow whatever they read on the internet without bothering to check it, if you want to find out what these disembodied quotes refer to, read the emails they came from you'll read a surprisingly honest discussion complete with arguments and certainties as well as uncertainties. Yes, there are uncertainties in climate science as there are in every field of science. But although conspiracy theorists get very excited when they see a doubt or an uncertainty expressed in the emails and take this as a sign that these must be secret, no instance has been cited of an uncertainty that hasn't already been openly discussed by these researchers in publicly available scientific journals. So, conspiracy theorists, forgive me my scepticism. I know that in this fast food age of instant gratification, it's not fashionable to check everything and examine the evidence before rushing to judgment. But that's the way I work. I'd rather be the last person to get it right than the first person to get it wrong.